G'day, and welcome back to Alternate History with Mates. Today we'll be exploring the fascinating question of what would have happened if Rhodesia had, had survived. As with last time, we'll explore how this could have happened, however this time we'll focus on how the world would have changed first, and then we'll take a brief look at 2021's Rhodesia. On the 11th of November 1965, Rhodesia proclaimed the UDI, the Unilateral Declaration of Independence. The white minority in Rhodesia declared the UDI out of fear of decolonization and the UK's wind of change pol policy which was encouraging this decolonization. Seeing events in the Belgian Congo as a stark um, warning, they declared this UDI out of fear. And what happened in the Belgian Congo, I'll just briefly tell you, is that the wine, white minority was in majority forced to flee or were killed uh, during the outbreaks of violence that occurred following Congan independence. Thus, they declared this UDI, the Rhodesians, when they saw this, uh, what was happening in the Belgian Congo. And this absolutely outraged the UK, who initiated economic sanctions on Rhodesia itself, and it also forced the UN to implement its first sanctions on a country. Rhodesia quickly became an international pariah, only being supported by Portugal and South Africa, Portugal, who doggedly held on to its colonial possessions until 1974, when it transitioned into a democracy and, abol um, and abandoned its colonies following this, what was dubbed the Carnation Revolution of 1974. When Portugal left Africa and became a democracy, this truly heralded its fall. Rhodesia, who had been fighting the Bush War since 1964, found itself in an unmaintainable position by 1979, with Mo Mozambique and Angola serving as bases with which to flood Rhodesia with guerrilla fighters, being surrounded on all sides. In addition, the international pr pressure and embargoes was taking a toll. Thus, on the 21st of December 1975, Rhodesia signed the Lancaster House Agreement, which ended the UDI and handed power back over to the British, who would hold the first democratic election in Rhodesia. However, as we know, this unfortunately led to the rise of Mugabe in our world and terrible famine, death, etc. So what if this changed? What if minority rule had survived? What if Rhodesia truly never died? Well, it is impossible to just end the Rhodesia Bush War. However, this does not have to have ended um, Rhodesia having this war um, continue. Rhodesia definitely could have survived even if the Bush War had continued to the present. The Rhodesian security forces were world renowned for their skill, especially against overwhelming odds. With only 1,120 Rhodesian security forces dying in the Bush War compared to over 20,000 guerrillas. What could have saved Rhodesia, and this is what Rhodesia needed to survive, were two key factors. A softening of international rhetoric against the minority rule regimes of South Africa and Rhodesia itself, and if Portugal had not had the Carnation Revolution and survived. On the first issue, this can be solved very simply by dealing with the po politicians. Public opinion in the West was actually kind of supportive of South Africa and Rhodesia up until the late 70s and, and early 80s. However, during this whole time period, even the late 70s, the public opinion was generally indifferent to Rhodesia and South Africa. So the opinion wasn't that they needed to embargo these nations until much later. However, Australian politicians such as Malcolm Fraser, who was the Australian Prime Minister, doggedly pursued Rhodesia, trying to force negotiations to end minority rule. In addition, successive US presidents and British Prime Ministers followed this lead and also attacked Rhodesia attacked Rhodesia. On the British side, this was motivated by hurt pride because they did not like it that the UDI, UDI happened, that they just declared independence from this. This hurt British pride and prestige. Therefore, if these leaders had be, behaved according to the public opinion, or just been generally indifferent, then at least, at the, at the least, there would have been a crucial 15 years of international development and investment into these regimes and 15 years without embargoes that could have secured these regimes that were undoubtedly hardy given all the pressures they had to resist in our time. Imagine 15 years without the embargoes.
that could make a serious difference. In addition, we could have seen a change to US policy, such as support for containment of communism in Africa. So they could have supported Rhodesia and South Africa more actively to stop these communist rebellions. This already happened partially in our time, with South Africa being indifferently supported by the US. Now, Portugal's survival as a dictatorship can be, uh, can be fixed in a couple of stages. Firstly, with the US change of policy, which would have meant further support for Portugal in its colonial wars in Angola and Mozambique, a major pressure that caused the revolution in our timeline was those wars. Furthermore, this international support would legitimise these colonial wars and weaken the anti-colonialism movement in Portugal, which played a major part in the revolution. Furthermore, if Portugal had aligned with Spain more heavily, perhaps a sort of nationalist bloc could emerge of Spain, Rhodesia, Portu Portugal, South Africa, which could play a key role in the Western bloc, being a major player supporting each other. As the bloc would expand following the Greek military junta takeover in 1967, these regimes would be solidified by each other's support, and inevitable US support given these countries' strategic locations and unviability to abandon now. They would essentially become too big to fail. This would have escalated the Cold War and had interesting effects, such as how would Vietnam had turned out if the Americans were also fighting in Africa? Spaniards in Vietnam, would we see that? What would have been the, the relations of the US to the Americas now given their alliance with Spain and Portugal? What would culturally, how would the Americas change with this? Finally, the last thing we need to change, just generally, is that these states would need to resist the liberalisation of media and other sectors which occurred in our timeline, thus preventing the ability of democracy to rise. Okay, now we can explore what this world would look like. So, Rhodesia and its alliance, which, can, which we'll just go over again, would have consisted of Spain, Portugal, Rhodesia, obviously South Africa, and the Greeks by 1967 would have been called the Alorca Alliance. This is because in real life, that was the name of the secret military pact between Portugal, Rhodesia, and South Africa. The, this alliance, the Alorca Alliance, would continue fighting bloody guerrilla wars to consolidate their colonies. They would also continue to take immigrants into these colonies, and these colony, as these colonies would be much more stable and acceptable worldwide, States like South Africa and Rhodesia, and Portugal and Angola, to an extent, would have a much higher white population by the mid-70s. For example, in Rhodesia, instead of having around a 5-6% to 6 white population, they would have a much higher population, around 15-20% to 20 would be white. Now, you can get to these numbers as, in our timeline, Rhodesia had high immigration, however, they had high emigration of whites too meaning that if this emigration did not occur because the state was much more stable and worldwide accepted, we can first double these numbers, and then obviously, because it was about the emigration matched migration in numbers, so we can both double these numbers, and we can also expand them, given that it would be a much more attractive place to emigrate to in our time. And there's already historical precedence for Rhodesia attracting a lot of white migrants. The same would occur with the Asian population, which would be um, which would increase as in our timeline, South Africa and Rhodesia encouraged the the Asian population to come in as they saw them like the mixed race population as a way of of outnumbering um, the African population and getting getting more support. This Asian population would only uh, compound once um, once South Vietnam fell in 1975, and there would be an influx of South Vietnamese Catholic refugees specifically into Portugal and Angola, which would help consolidate these colonies. In addition, there would also be Portuguese migrants and Spanish ones would increase, as active policies would be implemented by Portugal and Spain to encourage immigration to these colonies. As the 70s flowed on, this alliance could be used as the US for, as a proxy for intervention into the Americas, supporting rightist military regimes such as Chile, conducting coups in places such as Guatemala, without the need for U.S. invention, which would dirty the U.S. name. We could also even imagine that Spain could have been, um, could have been encouraged by the U.S. to invade Cuba, leading to a successful Spanish overthrow of the Cuban regime 
and as we know in our time Fra in our timeline Franco had ambitions for reconquering Spanish colonies so we could see a world in which Spain controls Cuba now we would also see this alliance including new regimes such as in Chile uh, Pinochet's regime and they would enjoy this in join into this pact and this would result in there being being more European um, immigrants into the Americas, so more from Spain and Portugal, and this would also lead to a reinforcing of the Iberian culture, so the Spanish and Portuguese culture in their former colonies, such as Chile. This would make these countries more European, and this would also affect the modern day conception of white versus Latino, and would affect the number of Hispanics in the US. Likely and this popula Hispanic population in the U.S. would likely be lower, given the Alorca alliance would stabilize these countries and reduce migration. Let's look at Mexico as an example. Now, we have two possibilities of what could have happened. Perhaps the alliance could have been given the go-ahead to take over Mexico uh, by the U.S. to stabilize it. Um, and this could have happened as Mexico became increasingly unstable in the 70s onwards. Or, and, or what could have happened is that the U.S. could have intervened in Mexico itself to limit Alorca power, because the Alorca alliance would have been promoting a, a fascist militarist takeover over Mexico, so the Americans sort of seen it strategically as important to place a strong Mexican government in there with military support from the U.S. Thus, this would have reduced the mi Mexican migrants into the U.S. if the Mexico had been stabilized. Uh, finally, just to touch on, again, on immigration in Rhodesia, there would also be a higher non-native population would be compounded as the 70s and 80s flowed on, as there would be additional Latino immigrants that would come in um, into these places. And we'd also see as, as international pr pressure would eventually and inevitably begin to come on, these, and there would be just that increased constant pressure in these nations of African rebellions, they would implement more policies like getting higher immigrants and they would also possibly begin to implement policies such as sterilization. So we would see these regimes becoming even more oppressive against the, their African, uh, African uh, population, which is precedence for what happens in these kind of regimes. So we would see like mini North Korea's almost here. And by the 90s, um, we can even look at Namibia, for example. By the 90s, Namibia would likely have a white pop population that would surpass the Afri African one, if not much higher, given that nowadays uh, Namibia has a very low population. And what would occur in these countries is, in a sense, a, high, uh, a lot of segregation where the Africans would live in one part of the country and the white people in one country. So it would make sense that Namibia would be one of the high white population areas. You can see on the screen... Uh, modern day segregation that occurs in South Africa. Now, during the 90s and the fall in communism, US and international support would collapse for these regimes and they would be forced to fight on all fronts, with the US backing insurgents in the Americas and backing invasions into these countries. There would now be a substantial cultural difference between Latino and European South and, South and Central American countries. For example, say Argentina becomes culturally European, but Peru remains Latino. This would create a lot of tension here. Uh, we can see precedence for this in history where Parag Paraguay used to pride itself on being the most white or European South American country. They saw that as a bee in their bonnet essentially a and thus they invaded other countries thinking them superior. So we can see this kind of cultural clash would occur in the Americas nowadays in this world. Obviously, with all these wars and the overthrows of these South Ameri these Americas regimes, this would further enhance Africa's Latino population. By the mid-1990s, Rhodesia would be aligning with African nations such as Rwanda, which were too based on ethnic or minority rules against tribes ruling over the other tribes, um, as we've seen in places like Uganda too, thus building an alliance with all these African nations which were ruled by minority tribes or ethnicities. Rhodesia would also be involved in the Congan Civil, Civil War, backing players, um, backing different players, then backing different players at different times just to generally destabilize a Africa to maintain their power. 
So generally, this alliance would grow in strength as, as Africa destabilised in the 80s to 2000s as they played these nations one and off each other and brought in African nations into the pact. As for a general overview of all these nations, let's just summarise what the world would be like today. For a general ro overview, Rhodesia and South Africa would exist today with higher populations and higher white populations. They would also likely have larger economies without having, specifically in Rhodesia, without the mismanagement that came with Mugabe and also without all the economic embargoes. South Africa would just be slightly um, larger because they would still have embargoes in modern day which would affect their economy. However, they would have lots of nations to trade with unlike what happened in our timeline. Greece would likely remain a dictatorship, having won the Greek war against Turkey in Cyprus in, during the 70s, with the support of Spanish, Portuguese, and other countries. However, this conflict is a whole can of worms I don't want to open up in this video. Spain and Portugal would remain dictatorships, as their societies would likely have been indoctrinated in this time period as being part of the Alorca alliance, and a further emphasis on a whole Hispanic identity. So linking them with the Americas and a kind of pride there. Anyways, so that's what would have happened. If you liked this video, please like it and subscribe. Thank you.